last event of Smart International webinars. It was a wonderful path, quite intense. We started talking about digital accessibility, new methods, innovative methods to improve accessibility in museums, to improve customer journey, to improve their products, also the user experience. Today, the focus is on theater and how to promote the heritage of different territories also involving citizens, promoting cultures as a shared responsibility that we have. And also for the community that hosts the cultural and natural heritage. We will do it as a part of this month project that allowed the organization of these webinars. We have Carlo, Paola and Stefania. As Carlo said, it will be a wonderful webinar in terms of content and in terms of experience. Carlo is laughing. This is, of course, a good indicator. I'm not going to steal further time. I give the floor to Gloria who is going to talk about the Piccionaia, and then Carlo Estefania will talk about silent play, this new technique for participative dialogue to promote cultural heritage. I wish you a good event. Gloria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you also to technical moderators, because they helped me upload in my presentation. But I think that uh, I will also uh, go straight to the point. It was just to give you an overview of who we are, the Piccionaia, La Piccionaia. We are partner of the SMART project. These are the members of La Piccionaia, a social cooperative consisting of artists, technicians, whose registered office is in Vicenza. We are all engaged in theater plays. Our purpose is the promotion of human being and cultural and social growth of individuals and communities. I think maybe for the interpreters, I should speak a bit slower. So we want to promote human beings through performance and theater arts. So La Piccionaia was founded in 1975 and uh, today is acknowledged by the Ministry of Culture as a center of theater production. As far as our activities concerned, I try to described in a nutshell, production and distribution of plays, research and experimentation of new languages and technologies related to innovative modes of production and enjoyment of the cultural experience and art. Make reviews of contemporary theater for new generations. We are very interested in active participation and audience engagement. We are active in theater education for all ages and different people with different backgrounds. We also carry out basic and advanced training for artists, technicians, teachers, educators, social operators, and workers in different social, educational, humanitarian, and corporate sectors and contexts. When I talked about new languages and technologies related to our field and also to innovative performances, and let's skip this, uh, this uh, slide. is just about our geographical location I was I wanted to talk about the silent play that is pretty much the subject the main focus of today's event also with Carlo and Paola I'm not going to take too much time 
talking on this because we have three other guests who know a lot about this. So I'm going to conclude here and I'll give the floor to Claudio. Thank you very much, Gloria. So, a small and short ice-breaking game just to check whether keyboards are working. You see bottom right there is the button for chat and then now I will ask the speakers to write in chat as quickly as possible the first word that comes to your mind after I say one word. It's a way to get into our topic. The first word that I want to pronounce is shell. Write a word in chat as fast as possible, please. For holidays, sand, first result, pearl. Now a second word. The second word is mountain. The second word is mountain. Type a word in chat as fast as possible. House, hill, these are these results. Great. And the last word is hide and seek. It's an, an Italian game. It's, just, it's a game. So the results are children, childhood. So this was just a quick ice-breaking game to get the ball rolling. This game has to do a lot with the theater approach to participation practices and to the promotion of cultural heritage. So, we started in 2009 during an important festival in Naples. The question was how to shift from information to involvement and engagement. We are at the Naples Festival Theater. My purpose is to involve young audience, a generation that don't recognize in theater a way of expression as they do with music. We create with a nice group, a nice working group, a play of Shakespeare, Storm, set in a wonderful urban architecture, architecture of the 17th century. The audience is told to walk in the different areas where the place are taking place. In this way, the audience feel immersed in an experience. They are not only observators, but they actively play a role. At the end of the, the play, they take a picture with the actor. This is quite interesting to me because for a young generation being part of the performance becomes becoming part of the play and you can see here some young athletes that uh, take a picture with their idol with their icon so being part of what is happening it's a new innovative way of involving audience because previous back in the day people were involved differently. If I consider the cloud experience, for example, when young generation, the youth watch a movie together, connected on chat, 
on when they spend afternoons talking on different devices through WhatsApp and things like that. The cloud experience is a sympathetic experience, but it's, it's a different kind of sympathy than the one that we live when we are physically together. But there is also another experience that I observed over those years. The first radio guides. I had a group of Japanese tourists in Vicenza, and I saw them moving together. Their bodies rotated at the same time towards a window to watch a monument and they moved all together towards the same destination. This because the voice of the narrator had them moving together. So live streaming, gaming, radio, gu radio guide, these tools can increase our experience of sharing our, our, our cloud, our bubble, I would say. This, we can share this experience with, uh, with other people. The theater is the space-time shared with others, with other people, in which an actor, an action, catalyzes and gives a shape to our attention. So I feel my presence in a performance when I can transform an intention into an action. I've stolen this quote when my action can influence the performance, when actors do something different, if I interact with them, I have the feeling that I am present. The feeling of presence is an extremely important element in the involvement and engagement of the audience to make the audience become a protagonist. We started back in 2010, we started to think of innovative visits in museums. So instead of descriptions, we try to do something different. The voice of Madonna talking about her perspective on a specific work or giving a sound to the Domus Romana in the basement of a museum in Verona. Sounds of chariots passing on the road, of footsteps, the, in order for them to feel an experience similar to those who people experienced back in the days in that specific moment. We moved also to urban landscapes and we started to take group of visitors to visit suburbs as if they were contemporary art museum to discover the invisible cities through the stories of their of their people and the narrations of those who planned those areas. The hidden tale of each place. So theater if compared to historical park of Villa Rossi, you, you can see here in Sant'Orso, Italy, to detect 16, 19 hotspots, 19 scenes, as Shakespeare would say, or Goldoni, scenes of narrations, and create a sequence in a sort of dramaturgy, just like an artist writes a, a dramaturgic play and creates different acts. We can create different hotspots in a sequence to recreate a theater experience for guests to become actors. So dramaturgy of places. So to create a sequence of potential tales of a place that can be located, that can be set in a city to be covered on foot or by river. For example, in the Silent Fireflies experience, we try to 
feel on our body what it, what happens in the hour that goes from sunset to the darkness through the accompaniment of tales, music and scientific explanations. Or in the case of another tale, a narration, trip to Campo San Piero, a medieval city that today is hidden in an industrial urban area a couple of kilometers from Balpa, searching for something that is hidden by that, but that can be seen if I walk in it. All of this involves the body dimension and the activation of our five senses and our specialization, what pedagogists call the environmental learning, is actually something that we live every day since we were young. And it's just like playing. In Stasera UNESCO, UNESCO tonight, we brought visitors to play together, to dance in Marostica, when they danced in, uh, in the different panels of the checky pattern with music to generate a small ritual, a dancing ritual, dancing in the street, in the square, or when we try to make people live again the places of World War One, recalling the histories, the stories, personal stories, personal lives that went through that big tragedy, or getting to unforeseen results, combining new technologies, the use of pack craft, this uh, small river vehicles to visit the cities of Veneto through the rivers. Back in the day, it was used for transport. And now we use it for tourism. Or to visit Monte Garoppa, a very important mountain, when there was the last battle of World War One, 1918, mountain that was hit two years ago by a subtropical storm effect of climate change. And we took visitors that, that were actors, actually, to fly there on the places of the battle with a look on the paraglider to the whole area from above as if they were birds. So sense activation, another series of pathways led us to the Orto Botanico to get involved in a quest inside the garden where we involved also people with disabilities. We created some focus groups and had people doing sensorial experiences with smell, taste, and tactile experiences. We took people to visit urban neighborhoods. We are here in Valdagno. We have two projects in two neighborhoods of Rome. We are, they are currently going on. We took children to, towards a symbolic trip, fairy tale, user instructions, Fairy tale becomes a museum to be visited and in which you can get lost. Final image, the open air museum of Belluno. If you go to Belluno, you won't see an open air museum. You will see a wonderful historical part. But when people get into this part of the city, that has now become an open-air museum. They close their eyes, and with their headphones, they are asked to take a step, open the eyes, and look at the city with a new perspective, with a different perspective. 
And as it happens also out of cities, in nice places as the Parco di Lagole, that actually hosted an ancient ritual, an ancient sanctuary of the god of sun and water. And through the suggestion of music and tales, people can live again those rituals of getting wet, for example, of the divinity of water. Silent play, the cultural resource, Dante Ravenna, a very important project that was presented, Festival of Only Planet last August, or for the Jewish Museum Network, in which Jewish culture can be discovered through action, through dance, or by tasting some food. A dynamic screenplay for social inclusion, because these type of experiences are born with a focus on inclusion, be it talking about social cooperatives or talking about refugees, proposing to audience to walk in their shoes, walk in somebody else's shoes and to experience forced displacement, an emotional experience, a strong experience, similar to the experience, to the, the emotion that a play produces, but in this case, you leave it in the first person. All their experiences comprise theater again, and uh, you have the possibility to look at the others in the eyes, to look at their gaze, witnesses of humanitarian crisis, and to experience with them something actively, involving the, the audience in an interactive way to create a desired outcome. And their way to leave the narration modifies the pace of content. Nothing goes on without being affected by what they do. But uh, their actions produce a unique experience every time. This can be done through a concrete experience, a mutual dialogue, but it can be augmented and increased through technology. This is the end of my 15 minutes. I asked you one minute, 53 seconds more. Thank you to all of you. Thanks to the interpreters who helped me throughout this speech. Now we'll give the floor to see how a participative play is born every time. Thank you very much. Now I would like to share with you. The silent play is pretty much about listening, so I'm not going to give more visual information. As you could understand from Carlos' speech, silent plays are different, are unique, are different every time because every silent tells about a specific place. They are different one another, but they have some, they share some points. One of them is the method for creating the, the, the play, the writing, is not a rigid method as you could assume by looking at the, at the, the, the screen here at the slide, this method for writing is quite flexible. And the topics within this method is the topic of listening, not only because they wear headphones, but because the whole creation process is based on listening. Another important word is definitely community. There is a community in which silent play are born, and then there is a community of people, of spectators, the audience, who enjoy, who watch, who 
who listen to the silent play. Today I would like to talk to you about the silent plays that we are organizing for this MAT project. Precisely, we are preparing three silent plays located in three different locations in Valdagno, a village in the province of Vicenza, Valaresia, Friuli, and Salfelde in Austria. These three locations have in common the closeness to the mountains. They have in common also the fact that they are a different height, height from the sea level. And there is also the presence of water that is a common thread, the fil rouge between these three locations. So in the first part, we can see that this project tries to involve people as much as possible sometimes organized by small museums or even smaller realities like schools that create laboratories. So, first point of this infographic is the parish map. So, the, the map of the community, what happens there? When we write the silent play, we meet people, we go and meet people, people who know the places, people who want to tell the story of their places. Who are they? Well, it depends. Sometimes it's groups of experts, they are experts. For example, historical center of Baldano, a silent play that was organized a couple of years ago. The municipality administration called us and they gave us the number of some people who could contribute to telling the story of the historical center of that, that city. Sometimes we, we say that we need other experts to add something more. In this case, we had experts of local history or the group of people are people who register to the laboratory, like in Lagole, a group of people who registered to the laboratory. And together we elaborated, we designed, we created our silent play. These people, of course, sometimes they also give a voice to the silent. Maybe we can talk about this a bit later in the at, at stage four. Or sometimes these are local communities. In the case of these three silent plays, the one in Valdagno, Cycle Path, the one in Salfelden, and the one in Resia, there were two levels. The experts, who were the people we got in touch through the administration, and whom we met, um, thinking about Resia and Valdagno in this moment, because the, the work is more advanced, and because COVID limited our work. The experts in Resia are people working in the two small Resia's museums, or in the library, or uh, municipality administration, municipality administrators, council administrators. And then there is also the group of people who answer the call and who for three days, uh, they came to us every afternoon and together we talked, we had a dialogue. And every time with Lucia, for example, we gave a topic, the topics we, we said came from the meetings we had with the experts previously, which is when we collected some some stories, some 
so I'm witnessing and we had to give them the possibility to talk one another in relatively small villages this might sound as something trivial something that one might take for granted but it's not actually like that there were people that were part of association people that were part of choirs a boy in Resia was part of the youth that are part of the parks assembly and it was quite interesting to have them all together there were people who are part of folklore groups there was a old lady who lived there another mother who came to us and people who never had the opportunity to have a dialogue even an informal dialogue on some specific topics not everything we talked about that was also taught to us will probably be part of the silent place because we actually will need to produce an artistic product but for them it was a possibility to address some issues the main problem in this case was uh, the I would say to promote the tourism of the valley of the valley in these moments we meet we talk in a more or less structured way with experts or non-experts people who are maybe are passionate about these topics that maybe answer a call or as in this case both of both of these two possibilities and then we trace our road map and then we walk then we walk a lot in this in this stage sometimes the the, the road the road map is not something trivial we don't take it for granted we build it from scratch and we know that in a given territory in a given era there are some points of interest that needs to be addressed that need to be crossed by us. In the case of Valdagno, Salfedene and Resina, the roadmap was already traced. In Valdagno there is a cycle path, a section has already been built, another part that needs to be built. In Salfedene there is a circular path bordering a lake and in Baresia there is a path that leads to a big fountain that we still couldn't see because every time we go there either it's snowy or there is too much water and you can't look at it but we know that it's there and we will soon manage to see it so in this cases the the, the path was already pretty much well defined what we still have to do is decide which are the points of interest, the different steps where we already got to point number three. Where do we want them to look at? Because the silent place is listening, walking and also looking at things during our path or during our paths. We want them to look at different things all together because maybe also for them who are locals they didn't look at some aspects of the territory as we wish them they did then there is the on-field test this is quite diversified at the end we write a draft of the text that sometimes is uh, written by us starting from what people told us sometimes is a sequence of different stories given to us by these people it depends again it depends on what we want to tell it depends on on what we are given and then we create a sequence create a chain like a necklace and then we sometimes we do this with a with a piece of paper 
in our hands. Sometimes we record it uh, with our phones like that. Sometimes we use these devices too. And at this specific step, we need to use a timer and understand that, for example, a given path takes, for example, 10 minutes. When we are sure about the text, the duration, and what we want to talk about, it's time to start recording. Usually the voices are either mine or Carlos one. It depends. It depends on who is working on that silent play in that moment. Sometimes there is one voice only. Sometimes there are more voices. Sometimes there is a narrating voice or two narrating voices. But uh, within this tale, there are different voices taken live from people we met on site on the field. And at the end, there is a, a small trial. You walk a lot during the whole silent play. And then there is the presentation of the silent play. The, the, the audience comes to us. We give them the headphones. We explain how it works. And then we start walking and listening. It's not a guided tour, a traditional guided tour, because it, it's not conceived as a guided tour, actually. But uh, as we already said, as Carlo already said, the people who do the silence, who the silent play, those who play, enter in a sort of bubble, in a sort of cloud, a colleague also likes to call it bubble, yes. But if you wear headphones, you feel part of a small community in a specific moment. People who do the silent play, they walk, they listen together, and along their path, they are invited. You saw the pictures of Lagole. They're invited to drink the water of the rivers, to put their hands in the river, to leave a trace to with a piece of chalk to express what they feel. Now, of course, COVID has created some issues in this. They are called to dance. They are called to make actions, to interact. In Marostica, we wanted to dance. We are tempted to, in Maresia path, we want them to dance. We are quite tempted to do it. I would like to stop the screen sharing now, and uh, maybe I can, yeah. I would like to share at this point something that I have to look up one second some sentences uttered by some people who work with us. Sorry, um, I can't do two things simultaneously. OK, I found what I was looking for. So some sentences written by people who did silent plays for Jewish museums. So a Jewish museum. So there were three museums, three moments of silence place before visiting the synagogue. These weren't visits with the guides. Before there was the silent play and then there was the visit. Two different moments. In this case it was the the path on the Shabbat, on the Jewish Saturday, a moment of stop, a moment of reflection. So I will invite people for to stop for 15 minutes. 
So, moment of peace for body and soul. Thank you for this wonderful experience. This is what was written. Thank you, Simonetta. Simonetta is the contact person of, of the museum in which we did that. Simonetta accompanied us with great passion, preparation, and knowledge into the Jewish culture. It was quite engaging the pathway of senses that prepares the heart to rest. So, you can see here, you can see that yeah, this can be compared to other guides. I also wanted to share with you some other pictures, some other things written by our audience, but I can find it. After the visits, we collect some feedback, and it's and it's very and it's wonderful all of this because receiving the feedback is always something very emotional. Thank you, Paola Rossi, from the La Piccionaia Theatre Center. There is another colleague to whom I will give the floor, Stefania. We have. We have known for a long time, known each other for a long time, but uh, she's focused not only on theater, she's focused on the topic of local heritage and digital museum. With an international experience of study and research, Stefania Zardini, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you for inviting me. It's always good for me to listen to you. It's wonderful to hear talking about Silent Place because I experienced Silent Place myself oftentimes and I also planned a few with them. And uh, the Lagule ones it was uh, something that we did together. And also the Balloonos one, which we tested with the working group with which I work. And now I'm about to share my slides so that we see if everything works well. It's a bit slow, but we're nearly there. I just wanted to say that uh, the experience that I am presenting to you today wants to contextualize a practice that I myself consider something that can be applied by museums in the future that I already do. And a few museums already collaborated with uh, Carlo and Paola on this new way of conceiving a cultural experience, in this case a theater experience, but also a museum experience. And I would like to talk about the reason why I decided to do a, re a PhD in participation in digital technologies. And I try to understand how and why participation is always more important in society and how museums could embrace these practices by understanding and elaborating new ways of uh, looking at ourselves in a, in a group. So I'm trying to share my screen but uh, I'm having some issues. Can you, can you help me with that? Technical support. I, I can't see the screen sharing button. Just tell me when I need to change slide, all right? Next. Perfect. So, this is who we are. There is an image of the Lago de Silent Play and also 
Museo Dolom. It, a participative museum created five years ago with a colleague you can see in picture to overthrow the traditional idea of museums as a, as a physical building that has objects from the past. Next slide, please. Great. Here I wanted to... Next slide. Thank you. I wanted to... I, I wanted to understand the extent to which digital and technology are changing our life, are affecting our lives. We have had a strong impact over the last years, but we were living, we were already living the impact, even though to a lesser extent of new technologies that can be applied in also in study and work. And uh, of course, these are not neutral tools because they condition us and create new opportunities. So I try to understand in museums how this word, how this, how this word was modifying, was affecting also the experience of audience in, in museums. Can you move two slides ahead? Thank you. In particular, as we already said, I liked the quote and the concept of presence. So when I feel present, I take action. I am part of the action. Through these platforms, I can create a profile to be part of the action to share my content. I need to be a virtual user within these experiences. So I act myself. I take action and I'm present. I can read, listen, I can create content. These are sharing platforms that are born in the context of our participative culture. And this concept has also been analyzed in literature, but uh, participative culture makes you feel stimulated to participate in the creation of content. And uh, what we do, this is what we do on the web, and this is also what museums are facing currently, because in a world in which we can interact with one another and experience in which I'm passive, I'm a passive listener. This kind of experience is pretty much outdated now. And this need is also emerging in the theater world, not only in the, in, in the context of museums. Another element, another component close to participation is uh, what Carlo called bubble, cloud. There is not only the interaction, but thanks to technology, we can get into some sound bubbles that can either be social experiences, but uh, also individual experiences or collective experiences. So we can isolate ourselves acoustically and listen to our sound, getting isolating from others. This is another trend, this is another technology that is changing a lot of our habits. So, let's get to the point. What is the impact of these new museums, of these new tools on museums? and on the way we live culture. Salim plays have a lot of dimensions which I wanted to analyze with you. The first one is the space dimension. So museums that we conceive as 
physical buildings and also theater. I go to a museum. I go to a theater, a museum that contains physical objects. Today, museums are also web museums. So the space can also be digital and the space of platforms and online platforms. But it's also an external place. Silent place proves that quite well. Museums also are mobile, are widespread. And I can create also a museum that doesn't exist in a physical space, but that moves in a digital space, which is what we did in our experience. Also, the object has changed. I was mentioning objects earlier, and I think all of you experienced going to museums and seeing their collection. Today, what we have in Silent Place are not objects. The memories that they collect from people and people who live in given territories, from locals, these are not tangible assets. These are not tangible goods, because today, the heritage, today the heritage is not only physical, concrete, tangible, but we also have sound collection digital objects not only the object is important but the whole process that is activated in people and it's quite tough today to define what heritage is then we there was a change in who the people we are used to think in, in museums and theater to the concept of audience visitors audience coming to our rooms but uh, silent plays show quite well that we work with the concept of community participate in community engage community groups of people paola talked about how these groups meet sometimes they are mixed groups and with virtual museum we work with schools with association with local associations but uh, we can also create a call and ask who wants to participate to the creation of a silent play. And this is not only related to the traditional idea. In this case, we work with different groups, and community is a key word in museums nowadays. Let's get to the final dimension, that is the the one of the practices. How? Practices are no longer designed by a narration or storytelling of one person who creates a story to represent an object, but these are co-narration practices. We have more voices involved in a given narration, a given storytelling. And again, storytelling does that too. We have many experiences, many memories, and each one can add a different new perspective. But it's not only the story of the place, but it's also my specific perspective of a specific neighborhood, of a specific area, or my perspective as a visitor, a visitor who goes to a place for the first time. <clears throat> so, we get to nearly to, to, the, to the challenge that museums or cultural world are about to face, to be conceived are participative institutions. This topic may be at the end of uh, will maybe help us to create something new. And also, this create difficulties, of course, because museums have always worked in a different way, in a more traditional way, in a more broadcast way, creating and sharing their content. But I just wanted to 
tell you that way before the advent of digital, in the 70s, there was an idea of museum, the idea of eco-museum, which now in Italy and France has been quite widespread, because beyond the presence of technology, the idea of eco-museum reminds us that museums are a relationship with the community. In this case, the eco-museums starts from the culture of people who take care about a specific area, specific place. This model can also be applied to other contexts, not only to museums. I also wanted to show you, maybe I will have you listen to something that we created with Dolom, but the, the interesting thing that I was mentioned before is uh, this path from the idea of tangible heritage and the shift to the concept of uh, intangible culture. We also have new technologies today, of course, but the most important thing is that, and Silent Place shows that, is the presence of a process, a process that doesn't start and doesn't end when the narration is concluded. Silent Place can be considered as a, an endless narration an endless narration that goes on also when the play is over, because you trigger something in people that continues over time. This is what we wanted to test also in different formats. I don't think we have time to, to take a look, but if you go to slide 24, I would like to show you what we did with Dolom. These are some of the products or better processes that we created within this virtual museum. We worked with schools in this case. We work with uh, young people to give them a voice to hear their perspective when they had the possibility to see to touch their heritage in museums. And I would like to share with you the El Moleta story created by children. We created, tested, and experimented with different products. Silent Play is one of them, but also other ways to use the digital component to create the storytelling, so virtual exhibitions, multimedia tours, blogs, sound maps, and audio stories. Maybe we can conclude if uh, Giuseppe can share the story of El Moleta. Grazie, grazie a te Stefania. 
So I think we created a threefold vision that integrate one another. Now we have a proposal. If any of you already have questions, you can also write in chat some keywords on which you which you want to discuss a bit more. We can definitely elaborate on what you say on chat. We talked about many things today, but if we want, we can look at some specific things more in detail, more in depth. The modes to create participative pathways through a particular tool that is theater, which we called Silent Play, which since 2010 has produced nearly 40 types of plays, some of which are still present in different museums. Carlo, I found a message that was left on the guest book of the Padova Synagogue. And linking back to what Stefania said, somebody here wrote, in addition to the comprehensive explanation, the immersive component made a difference. Experiencing things makes them unforgettable. So if I experience something, I will never forget that. Somebody in English said that it was a very impressive experience. Somebody, some things that remained impressed on the minds of our visitors. I just wanted to tell you this about the things that are left on the minds of our visitors. Wonderful. A method of artistic creation of this kind redefines also the internal relationships within the community. This is one of main research areas and also educational areas in Venezia, in Venice, the topic of social theater. Telling a story modifies ourselves because we, when we are back fr from holidays and your friends ask you how it was, we create a frame, we create a sequence that allows us to elaborate and to impress this experience in our memory. In the social context, telling something helps detecting some problems, some significant issues of the territory. Paola talked about parish maps, this technique that was born in England to ask a community which the significant places in the neighborhood in are. And this relationship permanently modifies the perception of people taking part to this laboratory with respect with respect to the past. Two examples. In Venice, you saw the image of visits on the rivers, on those crafts. Over five years, the citizens really understood how it was to have a river. They really experienced that. 200 people who experienced this silent play. First thing they told the people they knew. They were also visible when they were doing it. So I was walking on the Corso and I see this group of people on a boat on a river. And I look at them with a new gaze what they are doing. So the idea 
the theater can have a transformational role within the community is not something new. And I would like to quote here a dear friend who passed away two days ago, Giuliano Scapia, artist and poet, who since the 70s worked on these participative processes. One of the most important was the realization in a psychiatric hospital in Trieste he wanted to share their community to the rest of the city this action this process was integrated in a more complex series of action and led to a change of regulations with regard to the treatment of psychiatric diseases and psychiatric illnesses and they overcome the already existing model of for example mental institution so in this way we can explain how theater can be a way to link present and past and future so we wanted to for example, discuss three questions, three topics, because maybe something might not be clear. While we await your questions or contributions or even answers to, to these three questions that we are launching now, that we are posing now, I would propose to Stefania, we have roughly 50 minutes left. We can pose a question, we can discuss it together. If any one of you wants to get involved, we would love it. So great. The first question we wanted to ask has to do with the idea of multiple voices, the fact of having more voices, but uh, at the same time still having a filter in silent place you draft the text at the end and uh, with Dolom you have the group of museum educators that help children and participants to include references to the heritage which is also a filter so the question was on how to find a balance in a museum or a participative theater, a narration that includes multiple voices, not only the voice of the people who draft or create the, the story, but a model of multiple voices. How do you find the right balance? Because some, oftentimes when I present my practices in museums, the the people who are responsible for those practices are quite skeptical. Are skeptical because they think they might lose control. In the case of museum, it's more related to the control of scientific museums. In the case of theater, you might lose control of narration. So my question has to do with the balance. How could you find the right balance in all of that? Paola, do you want to answer this? You, you are muted. Yeah, I would like to share with you the story play experience in Ravenna, the Dante silent play. I was asked to write a silent play through some uh, streets and roads of Ravenna talking about Dante's life in the last period of his life. I took some biography of the author that are not that famous, and I imagine some meetings with the son of Dante and his friends who said 
a few things. This, this, I thought this uh, play was theatrically valid, but it was assessed also by the culture office. And since in Ravenna, the life of Dante is quite unknown, and if you want to talk about a biography, you need to have concrete information on that. Because they have the responsibility. The culture office declined this proposal because there were some doubts and they said that they couldn't. For me, from a theater point of view, it worked. I wrote it again with a, with a dialogue between two persons and I left the doubts to the narrator. And sometimes Tante talked to the to his interlocutor and there were only two persons talking. Maybe it was a bit more poorer from a theater point of view, but richer from a scientific point of view. Yeah, the important element is here is relationality. I always think about an anthropologist who inspired silent play, Frank Lachekla, an anthropologist who worked a lot in France with Marc Rouget. Frank Lachekla has a, talks about foreign people. And he, he says that they are seen and they see. It's a twofold function. When they get, when we get in a silent play model, we are like an anthropology. The participant observator, like the anthropological method. We need to be seen, we need to see, and we need to embrace. Because the society are divided internally. And this operation is not easy and requires an attention to the relationship. In a few moments, you need to decide whether to give priority to a content that is theatrically significant or scientifically significant. Stefania, probably you know the Sarabella Museum. Sarabella is a small village. It's an ethnographic museum, a museum with a wonderful collection. We met, we encountered a traditional legend the existence of a basilisk. And we found this, the stories of the elderly people who saw this small dragon with a terrifying gaze who could affect people just by looking at them. Between magic and real, Throughout our process, we met Mr. Guerrino, one of one of the spokesperson of this legend, and he doesn't want anyone to say to to be skeptical of himself witnessing the dragon. And here we have to decide whether to legitimize scientifically this legend. Or, with a joke, we might say he's old, he, don't, he doesn't remember. So here it's about being objective or being subjective. And in this case, we opted for the theater point of view. We wanted to believe in the legend. The audience will ask us at some point, but is it true? For Guerini, it's true. This is what we're going to say. It's not scientific 
from a biological point of view, but it's true from an anthropologic point of view. It's true what is seen by people. This is just to connect to what you just said. Maybe, Stefania, we can launch at the end. There is Guarino talking about the basilisk and talks about their counter. You could, you could see the, the front of the basilisk, not the rear part. And I think this narrative in theater reflection is important because museums, they collect objects, scientific content to explain also the context when they were born, but it's also a narrator. So museums tell stories. If you don't have stories, th those who live the stories are probably dead. So you need somebody to tell the story. So the theater gives us information, makes us reflect, makes us feel, smell. In the case of silent play, even more. I think that uh, this method could also help those contexts that are more oriented towards the theater aspect. Because if you don't involve truly the senses, you can't create an experience uh, that uh, is remembered by people forever. So here we have a there is a pedagogical a cognitive issue if we think that museums are a place in which you learn and that topic one of the things is that museums are also considered as places in which learning takes place there is gloria here yes i have shown up i don't want to steal time to further or potential interventions, maybe Stefania. But uh, while listening to you, I reflected in this last speech you were, d d this last dialogue. Carlo talked about the objective of involving young generations in the festival, and we saw young people taking selfies. With Paola, we heard about different experiences, local administration, who feel the need to, to tell their stories. Stefania led us on a journey in some very interesting topics. And now we are talking about Guerrino, that is the opposite side compared to those young generation who took selfies at the beginning. So I was thinking, this trend of eliciting audience to take part, is it related to the, to the reaction of, of the audience? What kind? I would like to, in the sense, if if any of the participants to this webinar maybe they had the possibility they wanted to share the reality of a territory that is dear to them there is a difference between generation is there a difference across generation is there the willingness to share the stories? What are the differences? And amongst our participants, is there this desire? Is there this willingness to tell the stories of our territories? I think it's quite an interesting point. Paola, you, you've you just finished work with a young generation in Nove. Yes, with the two silent plays there, one with the, the museum on the topic of ceramics. And then I was asked also some, to create some sound, uh, some sound uh, tracks. 
supplies. I was asked something else by the school, not only on ceramics. We touched different points with the museum and also with schools. And with uh, the, the with these uh, middle age, middle school children, we went through the city. We had some ice cream. We had the possibility to create a path with them. In the silent play of the museum, there was a description on the work. In the silent of the boys, I, I thought, and it was good to use an interview to another teacher. Teacher who was um, who owned an ice cream shop, uh, a coffee shop there, and there was a room to play cards. And at the end, in the case with the young generation, we had less information on ceramics, but it was quite fun. Stefania asked for involvement of young generation in the digital. Well, I was wondering, the book by Nina Simon, Participative Museum, starts with uh, why should I be participative? So we can ask this question to museums themselves. Over the last seven years, have seen different types of reaction by different people at different ages. We work a lot in social networks. We oftentimes launch campaigns and ask people to participate, telling their memories, sharing their stories on some topics that we post through hashtags, for example. And there is a lot of interest also by people who use social networks. They're not very young sometimes, but they have some groups, some historical, some historical groups on the city, and they have a lot of memories they share every day. Virtual museums, actually. So they have a lot of stories, you know? And I believe that uh, so many people want to participate and the role of youth is to transform many of these memories in a language they can better relate. We work with the LOM and they take this memory and they transform it into graphics, videos. They transform it so that they are not lost and in a way that is close to the platform's language. It's even, it's already far from my language because uh, I'm no longer considered a youth. But I think that digital component create an, in, an exchange between different generations. The important thing is that if you feel, you, if you feel like participating, participating, you can do it. If you don't feel like you don't have to, but the environment is a positive one. Awesome. One last thing, and uh, I wanted to I wanted to add maybe before launching the audio Guerino, I wanted to stress something very important topic within the smart project. We are working on. Valle Alpine, uh, in the Alps, the valleys, the issue of staying on the mountains or going to live elsewhere is very important. In Valdano, we work with a laboratory, high school laboratory, third year. The first meeting was, what can you see in Valdano? They said, there is nothing there. There is nothing in Valdano. Where do you see yourself in five years, around the world, in other places? Over four laboratory meetings, we started to ask them to identify some interest places. And we found a map of their interest places in Valdano. And actually, in the last meeting, they, were, they got passionate about this game. 
And they said, there are so many things in Valdagno at the end. We had them in front of us all the time, but we didn't actually notice them. This is when we were discussing with young couples about staying in Valdesia or leaving Valdesia. This is a very important topic. They have the role of habilitating or giving the possibility to create a new look at our territory, at our local territory. There is a transformational one. So Nadia is here. Do you have something to share with us? I wanted to thank you because it, it was very interesting, rich in contributions, insights, reflections. So our audience will probably be full of questions and full also of um, wonderful ideas. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Stefania, do you want to show the video of the basilisk? You are muted, Stefania. Great. Giuseppe has it. Giuseppe, uh, technician, has it. Da bambini abbiamo visto il basalisco, io e mio fratello. Allora, siamo andati nell'acqua. C'era un posetto così, col canaletto. Abbiamo giocato come fanno i bambini, in spiaggia per dire. E quando siamo girati c'era una grotta, una, un sasso così che veniva giù con un pochino di erba. C'era il rigoletto e l'acqua, uno qua e uno andava di qua. E noi da qua là si tirava a e questa bestia grande così, qua cosa che andava sempre giù. Io mi ricordo come avevo fatto la pelle. As you, so now, try and explain to Mr. Gurino that he doesn't exist. After a bit you will be convinced, or at least you will think that it's not important whether it existed or not. Thank you for your last contribution. Thank you, Stefania, Carlo, and Paola for this hour and a half together. Thank you for participating. Thank you, Gloria, for coordinating the whole thing. This is the last event, and I would like to tell you that over the, last, over the next weeks, it will be possible to receive the recordings of the three webinars organized within the SMART project in three different languages, Italian, English, and German. Obviously, you can find them on our Facebook page, and on our website page. Those who registered for in the events will receive the materials via email. I invite you to follow us on our Facebook pages to stay updated on the video publication and on our next events, the next La Piccionaia's events on Silent Place. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to the participants. Thanks to our audience.